Good afternoon and welcome to this ATT webinar, EMEA and Beyond. I'm Martin O'Donovan, Deputy Policy and Technical Director here at the ACT. And in this webinar, we'll be thinking through a few of the issues and ideas that uh, flow from EMEA. First, can I so briefly point out a few technical points about the webinar setup? Uh, you can tailor your own screen by moving around the various windows. You can resize them or minimize them. There's a Q&A box, uh, which if it's not already open, you can open by clicking the Q&A icon down at the bottom of your screen. Do feed through any questions that occur through to you during the course of the webinar, and we'll try and deal with these uh, near the end of our time. I should say, if we do manage to cover your question, we'll not be disclosing your name or company. Down at the bottom there, there's also a green button with a question mark on it, and that's for help if you need any help on technical difficulties. Um, then at the end, we'll be asking for your feedback, um, and that is done via the little red widget at the bottom, which again I'll draw your attention to at the end. In addition, there's a resource box just below the media window, and in that you'll be able to find a few additional white papers from S&P Capital IQ. There'll also be the, the slides and the presentation. S&P Capital IQ are sponsoring this webinar, and we very much thank them for that, and look forward to hearing from their speakers shortly. Finally, can I just remind you that a recording of this webinar will be available on the ACT website, um, certainly within two days' time, uh, along with a copy of the slides. Our panel today um, will start with John Doyle, who's um, Deputy Treasurer of Controller at SAB Miller, and he'll be telling us how they've been getting on with uh, MEO implementation. We then have Silvana Stagni from Hatch Sand, who comes at the subject from their specialism uh, as a global financial IT consultancy. We then move on to hear from two speakers from S&P Capital IQ, Hans Crockett and Cristiano Zazara, who will take us through some of the side effects and consequences that may spring from EMEA. So, can I uh, straight away hand over to John Doyle from SAB Miller. John. Thank you, Martin. Um, so my presentation really is, is a whistle-stop tour of Saab Miller's EMEA journey to date. I'll talk through some of the challenges Saab Miller has faced, tips for other corporates on the same journey, and we'll look at what might be next. Firstly, though, a quick introduction on Saab Miller's treasury activity uh, and where Saab Miller currently is on its EMEA journey. So Saab Miller has a, a wide range of financial instrument types, uh, so FX forwards, swaps, options, commodity trades, interest rate derivatives, intercompany, non-deliverables, etc. We operate in many jurisdictions uh, across the EU and outside the EU, so that includes the UK and m many other European countries, and we deal with a large number of banks, uh, and, and this really impacts on the level of, of compliance that we face with EMEA. In terms of the activity, we are a high-volume environment. We have a highly automated TMS, and due to this high-volume environment, it is, it is critical for us, really, that any extra EMEA requirements are aut as automated as possible. In terms of where we are now, we, we believe we are EMEA compliant, uh, and the UTI backloading and the portfolio reconciliation is, is still ongoing. So in terms of the challenges along the way, the number one challenge that we face, and I, and I think this is probably similar to a, a lot of listeners out there, is, is around clarity. So we've all experienced uh, the difficulty of the accelerated timelines uh, and trying to understand really what EMEA wants. Uh, I think the regulators and the trade repositories also have probably been overwhelmed really with the advent of EMEA and everyone in Europe trying to onboard at the same time. We've seen this specifically with the trade repositories uh, just the problems of having new trade repositories and, and setting everything up in time. In terms of the amount of compliance activity, there, there's really been quite a lot. So we've been looking at obtaining our LEIs, obtaining banks' LEIs, agreeing portfolio reconciliation methodology with all of our counterparty banks, agreeing dates for all of them, calculating our NFC status, declaring our NFC status, 
signing up to ISTA protocols for dispute resolution, getting legal documentation in place for trade repositories, etc. So there's really quite a, a long list of, of all the activity that is required to be compliant. In terms of portfolio reconciliation, simple in theory, however, not always so simple in practice. Um, a large challenge really is around building reporting capability. So there's been quite a lot of complex logic in terms of actually building that technological infrastructure. Again, with uh, some in clarity in terms of the methodology around it, uh, we've had to make assumptions there. And then backloading, which has uh, been a, quite a large project given the large volume of trades that, that we have. Getting UTIs right is uh, another kind of area of difficulty. So we are looking at importing UTIs from our, our trade platform. What happens with UTIs when you deal with non-European banks? How do we deal with intercompany UTIs? Uh, and how do we get UTIs in place for the, the, the many thousand backloaded trades that we need to upload to our trade repository? There are also things that come up. So for example, you know, on Excel, if you have a UTI that is more than 15 digits long, it actually curtails the digits above the 15 the 15th digit. So tricks like that that have come in that you wouldn't expect along the way. In, in terms of tips, really, uh, for corporates, I guess the number one tip is not to underestimate the amount of work involved. So I, I would say to start early, but really, I guess at this stage, it, 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 it's get going um, and, and, and keep chipping away. Um, liaising with peers is, is you know, we are all in the same boat here. Uh, many of the corporates are, are struggling with Amir and trying to understand what to do. And one of the real positive benefits that I think we've experienced with Amir has been the increased contact with peers and the um, desire, really, of everyone to, to share experiences. A key tip, I think, is to understand reporting for your repository. So understanding the concept of why you report and what you report is one thing, but actually getting that in an uploadable format and a successful submission is really a, a different thing. So how to bridge that gap is something really to focus on. Documenting assumptions, I think, is important. Um, given that there is a, a lack of certainty in some areas, it, it is just prudent, I think, to document your considered approach so that you have that on record for future reference. And again, automation is, is key. Uh, it is possible for some of the activities under MCARE, including reporting, to be very time consuming. So if you can automate wherever possible, that will help you to preserve value by avoiding excessive consumption of, of, of resource. Looking ahead to what might be next, um, EMEA came out of a, a G20 summit, so it's entirely possible or it is expected that there will be similar regulations coming out of other G20 jurisdictions. So we have Dodd-Frank in the US, but uh, the Australia is working on similar regulation and other jurisdictions, so for example, South Africa, India in the G20. But there's also some non-G20 jurisdictions, for example, Singapore and Hong Kong who are working on similar regulation, and it's important that you keep an eye out on, on, on what is coming there. We're seeing EMEA having impact as well outside of Europe. So for example, if you have a, a non-EU subsidiary that deals with a, an EU bank, uh, understanding really how, how EMEA will impact on that, on that relationship it is, is remains to be seen. In fact, there's, a, I guess, a broader question on how industry standard practice for EMEA will emerge over the next 12 to 18 months. So, for example, we've seen that the ESMA has written a letter to the European Commission to uh, provide clarity on the definition of derivatives, so that may well change. So, for, for those corporates who are relying on the exemptions for FX forwards, that, that, that may be taken away. But, of course, how reporting, for example, will develop uh, remains to be seen. And, and what standard practice there emerges. Lastly, uh, it's worth considering what opportunities there might be to extract value from EMEA. So, for example, portfolio reconciliation is now obligatory, and this is the type of thing that is typically done by external auditors at your year end. So if this is the kind of thing you're doing already, then maybe it's worth speaking with your auditors to see if they can place reliance on the EMEA portfolio reconciliation that takes place. And this may well lead to a reduction in audit work and maybe even a reduction in your audit fee, depending on how, how, how it turns out. So there I'll hand over to yeah. Martin. So th thanks very much, John. I, mean, I think that's an interesting theme to, to 
I mean, there is a compliance job, but also can one extract value out of um, the things we're being asked to do? Um, before we move on to the next speaker, um, I wonder if we could take a quick poll of our participants, and, and just with this one question here. Um, you can vote on these particular points just simply by clicking on, on the relevant button against the um, multiple choice answer. So, what is your state of progress in implementing EMEA? One, hardly started, but we thought about it. Two, we have an agreed plan and have taken the first steps, so you're just getting going. Three, we have all the appointments and agreements in place and we're at the testing stage. So you're getting going on that one. Four, we're fully operational, but still have a backlog of data. And I'm thinking there of sort of backloading old deals. Or alternatively, number five, we're fully operational and up to date. So if you can um, vote for the appropriate one, and we'll, we'll just have a quick look at the results in a second. So we, we have the results coming up here. Um, and what, what they seem to be showing is that um, I'm delighted to say that uh, most of you are thinking about it and have got going on it. Um, and a, actually a fair number, 29%, um, are fully operational but with a little bit more work to do. So um, that, that, that's great. Um, I mean, does, does that accord with what uh, our, our panel around the table would expect from what you've seen of things? Anyone like to comment? Well, I'm personally am relieved that the question one had so few takers. Um, I find interesting those are things to be up to date. The question of up to date of that being up to date with data is uh, is also interesting because um, the sort the backloading has different deadlines. In other words, you don't have to. Have you are compliant even if you have there is a time scale to if you haven't yes. done everything at this stage in other words today good okay well um should we move on now and, it, and in fact you're hearing there from silvano who's our, our second speaker um silvano can i hand over to you for um, um, your presentation yes that's one of the things that is interesting is that basically john has describe what the state of industry as as we see it from a global uh, financial IT point of view more or less is now. Uh, there are a couple of points I would like to raise as to why a lot of people are not as up to date or as compliant as would be um, Expected. It's one of the. I think the industry has been um, left in a sort of uncertain state by uh, deadlines that were being postponed and by some lack of clarity uh, in um, on the regulatory front, especially, especially sorry, when you come on things like. Uh, uh, the exception, in other words, the risk mitigation um, measure for non-centrally cleared um, OTC became, became effective before the rule, i.e. the centralized clearing. And uh, with the attitude of the, of the FCA towards monitoring um, compliance with the risk mitigation, where they said they would not do it for a few months. Uh, there is also, uh, to this day, uh, an uncertainty on cross-border um, issues in an industry that is actually global. And uh, um, EMEA and Dodd Frank are actually false friends. In other words, they're not as similar as one might expect. And uh, um, there is a situation that is evolving around the world with different dates of, ent of entering into force. And at some point, we will reach a situation where the major financial 
um, markets will all have a post-trade uh, reporting and centralized clearing regulation following the G20. And as John said, even juris jurisdictions are not part of the G20. But at the moment, we are not there. And what happens in the, in the meantime is still not certain. Um, there are a couple of, com of, of, uh, of issues that might be coming next. Uh, one is that in Europe, the MIFID review changes some of the definition of EMEA, and that may actually have an implication of what, on what is affected, especially if there is an attempt to move the definition of OTC away from the execution and back to the nature of the contract. Um, and also, uh, there are other, other tinkerings on, on the side which uh, it's, are better discussed next week after the vote from the, the European Parliament so we know what we have to discuss. Um, on the foreign jurisdiction, a quick note, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong are almost ready with their post-trade derivative uh, regulation. As a matter of fact, they were sort of supposed to be affected to kick in at the end of 2013, but they are more or less um, now into the towards the end of the first half of, of this year. That's all. Great. Th thanks very much for that. Um, that's if we now um, move straight on to hear from our, our two speakers from S&P Capital IQ. Hello, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, what we're very interested in from our perspective is, of course, what we currently have, for example, to address immediate EMEA requirements, uh, but uh, particularly as part of our uh, product management approach, in fact, we're always looking to uh, future consequences and changes that will come uh, with uh, legislation that is, or regulations such as EMEA and uh, some of the foreign uh, parallels that have been mentioned by our, our previous speakers, uh, John and Silvano. Um, so for us, <coughs> the current background and context is that there is a set of obligations uh, under uh, the European Market Infrastructure Regulations um, that, uh, of course, deal with the derivatives trade reporting. I think uh, part of that was well covered uh, by John from kind of a practical uh, point of view. Um, we have, uh, let's say, a particular offering focusing on uh, legal entity identifiers and collecting them from every single source that say, creates and emits them um, daily, uh, and also uh, taking on some of the particular challenges to do with how these may be modified by corporate actions or, or other types of events. Um, in terms of the uh, OTC central clearing obligation, so we're aware that uh, most of you in the audience will be below the mandatory reporting threshold. We, however, think that the context created by uh, the existence and the implementation of central clearing will actually affect everyone. Uh, it will also be an option. So just because you're below the, the mandatory threshold does not mean you should completely ignore uh, the option of central clearing, which will have benefits that um, Cristiano in particular will, will articulate. Um, we're also in the, in the context of uh, risk mitigation techniques that, uh, depending on, say, stages of EMIR and how your company is classified, uh, are partially already in force and will come in force later. So I think we alluded to some of the uh, complexity, the staging, and the confusion around all of these uh, measures and requirements. And, and uh, there certainly are some spread across all of the topics we've uh, briefly touched on. Um, so we think uh, requirements uh, related to risk mitigation techniques are, are relevant uh, because they're partially dependent on uh, the decision to clear versus that uh, not to clear. And uh, we'll be delving a little into the options uh, and side effects of either choice, where the choice uh, is available. Um, so in broad lines, actually, EMIR is part of a wave of global reform that both John and Silvano referred to uh, of the OTC derivatives landscape. And EMIR in Europe particularly goes a little farther in that it also covers the exchange-traded derivatives world, which some of the other global regulations do not. Uh, and, and that brings its own uh, flavor uh, subtleties. 
Um, I'd say the four pillars of these global reforms, as we can see in, in every region where they're being implemented, have to do with um, transparency, electronification, central clearing, and uh, margining for unclear trades. So transparency generally being achieved via reporting and cross-referencing entities, so we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. Electronification typically being uh, implemented through new platforms, and there's quite a range of them actually cropping up right now, uh, sometimes asset class by asset class, or rather derivative subtype by subtype. Um, the whole central clearing landscape will actually imply new costs and new relationships, even with counterparties with whom you've been uh, trading, I would say, for a very long time, and Christiana, Christiana will cover that too. Um, and of course, the whole uh, margining framework will, in general, affect the use of derivatives and collateral considerations that will uh, likely have quite a complex impact on most uh, corporates, in fact. Now, w we argue, and in, in actually also in a, in a white paper that you can find, uh, I believe, in the resources uh, section of, uh, of the website, um, we argue that Im implementing legal entity identifiers immediately has benefits that go beyond uh, mere uh, regulatory compliance, uh, and especially if uh, the LEIs are implemented alongside uh, some kind of entity hierarchy information, uh, and we'll mention in passing and say an offering we have in that respect, uh, and, and that enables uh, effectively anyone subject to this kind of regulation to implement a 360 degree view of suppliers, customers, and trading counterparties that will all be identified through their LEIs unambiguously across all branches and effectively all entity databases managed uh, by your corporation. So. It's often especially relevant if you're split across multiple countries where there may be local databases identifying local counterparties uh, in their own way. Uh, so, so we really argue for the benefits of harmonizing this across entire companies. Uh, now, Christiana will cover in a lot more detail uh, and, and be available to answer questions about how the clearing requirements will have a range of consequences that will go from uh, potentially increasing or at least modifying the trading costs and how your counterparties will pass some of these back to you, um, how hedging practices will be affected. So, for example, where an OTC might, might provide the perfect hedge, there may on occasion be some benefits, let's say, to look towards an imperfect hedge based on a combination of exchange traded derivatives, uh, and we believe that will happen. There, there will be uh, companies that will prefer to hedge with exchange traded derivatives. Uh, at the risk of not covering 100% of their uh, risk profile, as they previously did. Um, and again, we'd like to emphasize that there, there are benefits opting for central clearing, even where you're below the mandatory clearing thresholds. And in fact, that would be a, a global uh, a global phenomenon, or in fact, in every region where this regulation is active. Uh, we believe the relationships with banks and clearinghouse members will be modified, or in fact, uh, it will be a new one uh, for a lot of your corporations if you, if you don't have one before, for example, with clearinghouse members. Um, there will be a consequence in terms of how they classify their customers, so you may find some of your terms uh, for dealing with them are less favorable than they were pre-EMIR uh, for, for a number of reasons, uh, particularly that may have to do with the types of collateral you are able to offer. Uh, and, and that will also be addressed uh, by many parties through a process called collateral transformation. So if you don't, for example, have cash or the types of AAA bonds that they're willing to accept, there will be processes that naturally will cost a little bit um, that can be referred to as collateral transformation to allow you to enter into trades, uh, derivatives trades with them nevertheless. Um, and I think I'll quickly jump over the next few, but we believe the landscape of the types of securities uh, in this space will change as well. So there's a trend towards futurization of certain classes of derivatives, uh, predominantly in a first phase, uh, futurization of interest rate swaps, and that would be interesting to corporates whether or not you're above or below clearing thresholds, uh, for example. Um, so I, I won't dwell on this very much. I mean, you'll, you'll certainly find uh, more detailed information in the, uh, in the pack that is attached uh, to the resource uh, center, but uh, one of the offerings we have, which we maintain actively daily, is what we call a business entity cross-reference service, and that is actually linked to uh, hierarchical mappings uh, of, uh, of, of companies as well, of entities rather, uh, and most of our clients use this service, some of whom use it for uh, EMIR compliance purposes, 
uh, actually use it for the kind of 360 degree uh, risk view uh, that I, I referred to earlier. So to identify uh, concentrations of risk uh, across different types of uh, sectors, entities, uh, counterparties, uh, suppliers or customers alike. Um, next, we have a global instrument cross-reference service. So as part of the mandatory trade reporting requirements, uh, there's only a small number of instrument identifiers that is accepted by regulators, and it could be that your systems traditionally or those of the brokers you work with uh, use different identifiers. So we're finding quite a lot of interest uh, driven by this new regulation in, in that product as well. Um, and then I said we have a few that are peripheral or add-ons, such as a, an industry segment cross-reference service where it becomes important under certain types of regulation to report concentrations of risk uh, by industry sector or entity type, um, et cetera. So we find these three offerings are typically used in combination by our clients trying to address this body of regulation uh, of which EMIR forms a, a part. Um, and I'd say if we could articulate just in a few points the major benefits of using such a combination of offerings uh, is that effectively you'd be able to use industry standard security or entity identifiers to look up LEIs if, if you uh, don't have them uh, natively in your, in your current databases. Um, the mappings to ultimate parent entities actually enable people to identify a concentration risk they weren't aware of, so you may be trading uh, or, or have a customer or, or an OTC derivative counterparty that is part of a larger company, and it's actually very hard to realize that ultimately you may have five, six, seven trades or uh, processes effectively exposed to the same uh, ultimate parent. And, and I'd say our, the kind of offering I, I uh, just described actually enables you to have a, a rapid view of this and identify those types of risk. Um, lastly, we're aware that these uh, maintaining and managing such um, databases that are typically updated daily from multiple counterparties throughout the European Union, in fact, that number may go up to 27 if every country has its own uh, local operating unit at some point um, issuing LEIs. Uh, the, the, uh, effectively, there are offerings out there that remove the headache of maintaining and scrubbing all of this information and these identifiers, especially when um, corporate actions will actually modify their profile, their ID, or their name. Um, now, I'd like to pass on to Cristiano perhaps to give you an overview of some, some of the other offerings we have and how they are relevant, especially in the clearing context. And thanks, Hans, uh, for, <coughs> for this uh, overview. So what do we have uh, as well, uh, in addition to, to the reference uh, offering, is uh, obviously about pricing and evaluation. We have uh, a dedicated uh, division uh, providing these services for uh, OTC and uh, fixed income uh, securities. And uh, obviously also credit risk uh, metrics uh, that allows uh, users to understand uh, what is the rating, uh, but also the probability of default of the counterparties, uh, and also some uh, market default-based information coming uh, from, uh, uh, from, the, from the market, uh, from the equity market and the CDS market uh, as well. The, the, the most important point of the discussion, obviously, is that we have talk, discussed, uh, given, not given an overview on the, on the, all the EMIR uh, pillars, uh, transparency, electronification, uh, uh, clearing, uh, Margins on unclear trade, but what is in a way the, the implication for corporates, right? So, and that's the most important important uh, topic uh, uh, to discuss because uh, the majority of the players are obviously financial institutions on the one side, but obviously non financial company, companies uh, play a significant role in this market because uh, all the non financial companies edge their exposure with a certain kind of derivatives uh, during their normal course of business, uh, and then they have uh, lots of exposures uh, on uh, typical. Uh, interest rate swaps, uh, effects if they have international exposures, much less on the CDS side, obviously, because it's more on the financial institutions uh, 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 side. But still, in a way, corporates uh, are heavily involved in uh, trading uh, uh, OTCs, uh, OTC derivatives. So the big point is that uh, this uh, OTC, we call it a revolution, uh, will have uh, a significant impact. Why? First of all, because there is uh, apparently an increase uh, in the cost cost of derivatives because you, everybody needs to post uh, a collateral now, it will be the practice, uh, while uh, up to now in some cases uh, collateral uh, has been uh, 
more uh, discretionary issue between counterparties, and uh, not only on the OTC derivatives that will be cleared, but also on the OTC derivatives that will be non-cleared. Also for those, uh, the Basel Committee and the IOSCO uh, proposed some rules uh, whereby uh, all the OTC derivatives also unclear will be subject to the same uh, initial margin, uh, daily margin, uh, collateral, uh, collateral posting. So the big problem uh, is for banks uh, how to manage uh, this new uh, world, and particularly for non-financial companies, uh, how to comply with the rules uh, and how to find uh, the proper collateral to be posted uh, against OTC derivatives. So the big point is that uh, uh, the, the issue is that, uh, fortunately, for non-financial companies, uh, only financial, non-financial companies uh, that have uh, certain trades above uh, uh, specific thresholds uh, will have uh, to uh, be subject uh, to the mandatory OTC clearing. So if they have, for example, one billion uh, of exposures in gross uh, in, uh, notional values for uh, interest rate or credit and three billion in effects and commodity, only those uh, large companies will have to uh, will be subject to the mandatory OTC clearings. The others will be exempted. However, the point is that uh, not necessarily being below the threshold means that they, they, will have, uh, they will live in a free world, right? I strongly believe that the market practice will be for every kind of institution, any kind of end user, to be subject to the same rules of posting collateral and posting daily, daily margins for, uh, for keeping up with the market, with the market prices. The, the, the big point, uh, again, is that uh, what are, the, what are the solutions for many companies? So if they want to trade or to see derivatives, first of all, they need to be heavily uh, solid because they need to have uh, lots of securities, uh, eligible securities and cash to cope with this new situation. Alternatively, there is another possibility, which is uh, that of replicating uh, aging, uh, current uh, OTC derivatives ages uh, with uh, futures, right? Uh, Hans mentioned the futurizations of the OTC derivatives market, and it is extremely irrelevant. Why? For mainly one reason, because uh, trading the futures uh, will require much less uh, margins and then uh, much less collateral. In a sense, if, if you trade the futures, you will have to post 50% amount of collateral compared to an OTC clear trade, and uh, maybe three or four times less than an OTC that will be uncleared. So many, in, in, in many cases, uh, there is a possibility for many of these edges uh, through OTC derivatives to be replicated by futures. The big uh, obstacle here is that uh, the market uh, is not uh, probably properly educated on this, and sometimes uh, not necessarily everybody recognizes the possibility of replicating the uh, OTC derivative edges. In addition to that, there is uh, also a, a big, uh, a big bottleneck in the sense that uh, there are not many futures products available in the market that allow this kind of replication. However, many CCP exchanges are now coming up uh, with several uh, future products uh, able to replicate uh, the OTC uh, derivatives, such as uh, CME came up uh, with uh, new deliverables for futures, ICE with a credit futures, and many companies are increasing the offering on the future side to uh, allow companies, and particularly non-financial companies, to lower the burden of posting, uh, of posting collateral. But at the end of the story, our, uh, the bottom line uh, is that uh, the goal of the regulators is to transform all the OTC derivatives into a sort of exchange traded. So uh, the majority will be cleared. The majority will uh, be traded on uh, platforms, the so-called Securities Exchange Facility, CEFs. And then uh, we're going to see much more uh, increase in liquidity, compression of beta spread, more transparency that will be very beneficial to, to the market. And the most important thing that uh, not everybody realizes is that uh, the OTC clearing particularly is going to reduce to zero the exposure to counterparty risk. So counterparty risk now will be fully transferred from uh, any kind of users, non-financial companies, financial companies, to the central counterparties. So the credit risk, the, the risk of having a default to the counterparty will not be longer there. 
And this is the major, the major benefit of this reform that sometimes is neglected by many users. So they, users are concerned about increasing cost, issues about liquidity, collateral, but I think one of the, the main benefit is completely removing the default risk, which is a, it's a rare event, but when it happens, it's catastrophic. It's very difficult to manage. Uh, it's not very easy, particularly for non-financial companies, uh, to, uh, to measure, to quantify it, uh, to sometimes uh, to uh, understand it. So the, the point is that uh, the main uh, issues is that we are, as a company, able to obviously um, provide uh, many uh, additional information that we are listing here and uh, are included as a backup material. So we can provide info on the margin calculation, on the collateral, uh, also on the uh, requirements for OTC market derivatives, uh, and uh, particularly on, on our offering on the cross-references on the, on the uh, analytics. Uh, in, in closing, I think that, uh, again, uh, the major uh, benefit of this resolution is the simplification. So everything will be simplified, uh, more liquid, uh, more transparent. Uh, uh, again, there will be some issues, particularly in the beginning, uh, because we have also a uh, bifurcated approach between the United States, uh, Europe, and also Silvano mentioned. They are brothers, but not twins, so there are some significant differences. Uh, one of the, of the main differences, for example, is that uh, OTC derivatives and also exchange traded uh, must be reported to trade repository in Europe, but not in the United States under that threat. So some of these are extremely uh, relevant. Uh, to wrap up, I think it is a very important topic. Uh, lots of uh, information needs to be provided, lots of understanding around this, and uh, we as a company are ready to provide support to all non-financial companies in the world to couple with this new OTC uh, revolution. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Cristiano. Um, as you can see, that there are some extra materials which we, we're not displaying here, but they'll, they'll be in the resources box. Um, so it's worth looking to, through for that um, extra detail. Um, we now move on to sort of questions. Um, there's one that's come in, in here, which was very much picking up on your point there about the trend towards collateral, simply asking how much of a push is there um, towards collateral? to be posted by corporates? In other words, you know, is there actually a, a, a pressure happening? Or can I supplement that with my own question, which is it actually cost effective? Is, 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 are the savings and the, the finer pricings making it worth it? In many, in many cases, for non-financial company, this is a mandatory requirement, so there is no choice. This is not an option. But if you are a small company, obviously, I think the market practice will be for everybody to post collateral, so banks selling derivatives will last for, for collateral because it will, it's going to reduce their own capital requirements. So definitely it will be a requirement. Secondly, on the, on the question about uh, the cost effectiveness, uh, sure, obviously collateral is going to decrease because the higher the collateral, the lower the, the margin to be, to be required, right? So it's exposure minus collateral is equal to margin. So the more you post collateral, the less capital requirement for banks and then the less the price for, for companies. So th there are some advantages, but equally there are some disadvantages if you don't have that spare collateral. That's the big point. And so, That's the big issue. But, but it, it, it is something that people do need to start thinking about. Yeah. Um, can I sort of switch subjects a little bit um, to pick up another question on NEIs? Um, the question here is, can a non-EEA SPV, well, let's say just company, a non-EEA a non-EEA company dealing with an EEA bank be forced to get an LEI. So if you're outside the EMEA region, you don't strictly need to have one. Um, well, you do need one so that counterparties within the EU region can actually trade with you. So, <clears throat> I mean, the, the regime has not been very specifically defined yet of what will happen, say, if you trade with a counterparty that does not have an LEI, and that would actually push you to uh, uh, miss out some of the mandatory fields in trade reporting. Now, we, we've spoken to some, uh, some brokers, in fact, who said they simply will not accept any trades if uh, a counterparty coming to them does not have its own LEI, but that is, at this moment, their own decision. Uh, we're aware that the regulators want to enforce that. It will either be through a regime of fines or through actually stopping people trading if both sides do not have an LEI. 
So it's not, not formally defined, but that, that's the way we, we see it. Going. Yeah, there's also a distinction to be made between the, 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 rule, the regulatory rules and the market practice, right? So the market practice, I think, is going towards uh, accepting only those with an LEI, uh, even though the regulation doesn't say explicitly that. So, which is so yeah, so even though the external party is it's not forced by regulation, but commercial practice and contract and the need to find someone who's prepared to deal with you will perhaps force you in that direction. From just very quickly, from an implementation point of view, just think you would add an extra step in the process. Does that counterparty have an LEI? Yes, no. Is it allowed to not have an LEI? Yes, no. Will I trade with them anyway? Yes, no. It's much easier, much simpler, much more straightforward. No LEI, no, no trade. Yeah. And, and Truth to tell, getting an LEI is not hugely onerous. I mean, yes, there is a small cost, but it, it is really just a matter of registration, I believe. Correct. Okay, um, let, let's move on to a, a, another question here. Um, how do we expect the regulator to respond to incidents of non-compliance with EMEA? Um, we asked external legal counsel and were advised that there was no process for reporting non-compliance nor was it clear if any sanctions might be imposed. Um, does anyone feel happy to comment on that? I just say, yeah, I virtually alluded to that earlier in that uh, what will potentially happen is there'll be a regime of fines. I think the first stage is there'll be a, a formal telling off of some form through a letter. Uh, and it seems some of that has begun on the fringes, but that, that really is the first wave of it we expect, because uh, regulators will tend to be relatively lenient in early phases, although they will certainly not express that explicitly. Um, and you'll be out of business the way you <laughs> So I think, I think um, informally there is a little bit of regulatory uh, forbearance going on at the moment, but there will come a point when there is a hard deadline. If MIFID 1 is any indication of what might happen in the future, you will have a period, which with MIFID 1 was about a year, where you could have made a case that you were getting there. In other words, you have a program in place, clearly documented, but you are X weeks away from go live. Then, all hell breaks loose. After this period, you may actually even be closed for non-compliance. Yeah. I mean, the area where I do wonder what will happen is, is for the very, very much smaller company that, that really is only doing one or two or a dozen deals a year. Um, whether they'll disappear below the radar. Um, I mean, strictly speaking, they have to comply, um, but we will see. Can I talk, move on to a, I think we've just got time for one more question. Yeah, why don't we have one more? Um, yeah, looking at LEIs, um, we've heard how the, there is the possibility that they can be more widely used. Um, can I just sort of clarify how, how well is the control over the issuance of LEIs? I mean, can an entity have two, or can somebody go and get an LEI and pretend to be me? Right. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of inbuilt controls in the LEI system. Uh, some of the complexity is that so many different uh, agencies, I would say, can issue them throughout Europe, but also in the U.S. So you can get uh, an LEI that is valid under EMIR issued by, uh, for example, the CC Utility, whose name has just changed recently. I'm afraid I don't remember the new name, but uh, in the U.S. Um, now, there, as part of uh, what is called the global LEI system that is still currently being built up, all of these agencies that can issue LEIs must check with one another whether or not they already have issued one, and they have controls in place to avoid the duplication. I'd say on top of that, uh, some database vendors, I'd say su such as us, have our own scrubbing processes to double check because uh, there, there's still the potential for accidents uh, in that process uh, from either parties, uh, in fact, from any of the parties. Great. Well, our, our, our time is ticking by, but there have been some interesting subjects raised here and as to whether some of the elements of EMEA have yet to evolve in, in the marketplace. You know, will we see more collateral? Um, will we be able to use LEIs uh, to get additional information uh, and actually get some added benefit out of all the work we're going through at the moment? So can I thank all our speakers for participating? Uh, certainly thank S&P Capital IQ for their sponsorship too.
Um, and for all of those of you who have submitted a question, I I'm sorry we, have, if we haven't managed to get through all of them. As I mentioned at the start, we will be putting up a recording of this webinar on the ACT website, um, and that should be ready in certainly within a couple of days. Um, we'll be sending you all a link to that. Looking forward, there, there are further events on, in the ACT calendar. We have several major conferences coming up. Um, our flagship conference, uh, annual conference, is in May up in Glasgow, and that one is packed full of all kinds of different uh, topics, uh, including a, a very large exhibition of various service providers. Over and above that, we have webinars. Um, there's one mentioned there on the screen. Uh, the program will be continuing throughout the year. So, finally, can I thank you all for listening and uh, point out that the, there is this little icon at the bottom that you can use to give us feedback on, on how the webinar went. That's very helpful to us. Uh, the facility to do that will remain open just for a short while after the webinar ends. Um, but from all of us here, um, thank you very much and goodbye.